So, before I introduce uh, Mr. Tony Melotto, who comes from the Philippines, I would like you to, uh, to encourage you to look at the, the scribbing, the drawings which are on the right side of the room. So, I would like to, for you to, to make a really uh, a warm welcome to Tony Melotto, who is an economist. He's a social entrepreneur. Uh, he has um, founded an ONG NGO called Kawad Kalinka, which has done the most extraordinary things, which I will let him tell you about. So this is a testimony, and I think you will be very impressed and moved. Please. Stand in front. Yes, I I am okay here. Thank you, Mr. Wasserman. Uh, I was given a very ambitious uh, topic there to challenge the impossible, and uh, a friend, uh, a, new, a new acquaintance uh, in the table just uh, told me that uh, the impossible thing to do this afternoon is to keep you awake. <laughs> After a long day. And uh, I think the greater challenge is how to keep me awake after 24 hours of travel from Manila. <laughs> uh, it's such a privilege and an honor for me to be here with you. It was all, it was worth all that uh, travel from Manila to Hong Kong, from Hong Kong to Amsterdam, <laughs> from Amsterdam to Zurich, and uh, <laughs> by train from Zurich to Zermatt, <laughs> and to stay here for a couple of days and fly back, <laughs> and rest for one day and fly in Manila and fly to Orlando, Florida. Uh, this has been the pattern of my life uh, since my midlife crisis at the age of 35, and I am now 64. And I thought it would slow down, but I realized that uh, when you start something that is uh, beyond your ability or your desire to control, because it is not your work to begin with. That working for the higher good, for the greater good, for the common good, you know, resonates with the aspirations, with the uh, desire of uh, people, regardless of religion, race, or culture, in our shared humanity, to see a more sustainable planet. And I'm here, and I look at the hall, and I seem to be the only one who traveled all the way to, from Asia. No, 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 from Singapore. You just came from Singapore. Okay, <laughs> good. It would have taken it would have taken me only three hours to go to Singapore. Yes, but, uh, but today I'm just here to, to tell you our story and to speak about our journey from a very uh, personal uh, experience. I feel that I have given enough PowerPoints and written <laughs> a lot of, uh, of uh, articles about the organization that uh, I am here with people who have achieved much and uh, just like me, continue to find uh, ways of uh, discovering innovations, how to, to uh, build on the good that they have already done. Three things that uh, we all share, I believe, uh, uh, that are our greatest concern in my country, uh, first of all, uh, is uh, climate change vulnerability, especially in the Philippines with 7,000 islands and that 
in the Pacific, uh, where we experience a lot of, uh, of uh, climate change uh, consequence. And so our problem is really not only to adapt, but to also help mitigate. The second thing is, of course, the, the impact on food security. And this also uh, aggravates uh, the extreme poverty that we have. And this has been my journey uh, from the very beginning. I came myself. It, first of all, I had to challenge the, the impossible beginning with myself. I, you have a picture here of the shanties uh, that uh, represent poverty in my country. But it also shows the, the solidarity of the poor. When uh, they, that is, uh, that the, the typical word for that in my country is bayanihan. It is about people helping one another to move uh, their house from place to place, and uh, and uh, what we have here is a is a video that's being shown in different schools and different uh, uh, movie houses about the mission of Gawad Kalinga to end poverty by being in solidarity with the poor and the rich. And uh, it was important for a person like me who came from the poor, who experienced also extreme poverty, and, but had uh, uh, challenged the impossible by really discovering a path out of it through education. And at the same time, not only was I poor, I was also handicapped because I am blind in the left eye. I, it just again, was a, a consequence of my desire to rise above also the limitations of my birth. I would climb trees and I would climb roofs, and at the age of 12, I fell down from a mango tree, and I lost the sight of my left eye. So not only was I poor, but I was also blind and cross-eyed. And I thought it would be really a, a bleak future for me. No, date, no girl will ever be interested in a guy who's poor and who's cross-eyed at the same time. So the impossible thing was for me to be able to even discipline my left eye, which was a lazy eye, to move with my right eye that after three years, you know, it didn't look so bad anymore. But anyway, <laughs> um, education was my way out uh, of poverty, and I was able to get a scholarship uh, through American Field Service to the United States at, age <laughs> at the age of 16. And uh, it helped me to overcome also again uh, my own insecurity, because uh, uh, I gained uh, confidence to speak in English, and uh, because uh, it was in California where I ate steak for the first time. So I made sure within a year that I had enough food to at least, uh, you know, address my, my own physical deficiency because of malnutrition. But anyway, that also led to another scholarship in the number one business school in my country. And so, I guess, uh, I follow the path of a lot of uh, people and uh, in terms of trying to, to really uh, uh, use education to fuel their ambition so that uh, they can achieve uh, a success in career and, uh, in my case, never to uh, pass on the legacy of poverty to my own children. So, I had my degree from a top university and it gave me also the right to marry a woman with a degree. <laughs> That's how it is in my country. Because the rich will never give a second look to the poor. And uh, it also gave me the aspiration to work for a big multinational company. Because the school that I attended was designed by, by a big multinational. The management course was designed by Procter & Gamble. So my ambition was to work for Procter & Gamble, and I did for six years, where I headed marketing, uh, uh, purchasing, and also learned about branding and, and, and marketing. Anyway, just uh, uh, I guess it had to begin with me, that uh, never allow again the limitations of birth or, or the difficulties uh, in life to, for me to lose uh, my own spirit that uh, life can be better and is something that we have to pass on to other people, to my children. The only problem was that my the definition of success was uh, get the best education, have a, a great life, raise a good family, uh, live in an exclusive subdivision, send your kids to exclusive schools, 
and uh, go to church on Sunday and give to charity. But I guess at the age of 35, I realized doing that did not make me happy or secure about the future of my children. And so I realized that by building an artificial bubble of, of, of comfort and safety and status in a, a sea, in a growing sea of third world poverty around me. And uh, because uh, we continue to perpetuate uh, an economy and a culture of exclusion where we did not consider the poor as family and friends. They were just simply objects of charity. So that's when I went, uh, I decided to quit my, you know, my, 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 my job and uh, I became a missionary for 10 years. So again, I went to the other extreme for 10 years, uh, went around the world establishing uh, Couples for Christ and also the Ministries for Youth and Singles called Youth for Christ, Singles for Christ. I looked for solutions of, to the problems of this world in heaven, but I came to realize at a certain point after 10 years, how could I speak about heaven in the afterlife if I allow God's people to live in hell in this life? So that was, again, my, I had uh, my own uh, experience in Australia, which brought me back to the slums of Manila. And that's when Gawat Kalinga started. And uh, the, the, the challenge was, how do you, how do you uh, start? How do you start? How do you enter the world of the poor? I came from the poor, but I forgot about them. And I could not even blame the rich for not uh, being compassionate sim because I came from, from the poor, but, uh, but uh, at a certain point, I didn't want to be like them. So anyway, to cut the long story short, my own brokenness, despite the worldly success I had, and even my own spiritual journey, was simply because I was living in a country that had no excuse to be poor. We are resource rich. Singapore is built on a small rock. They have less than five million population. We have nearly 100 million. We have the, we have the most fertile land, over 12 million hectares of fertile land and the highest biodiversity in Southeast Asia together with Indonesia. 73% of uh, all the life forms in the world will grow in my country. But why were we poor? And we were poor because those uh, privileged with uh, education, with, with success, with, uh, with uh, influence, with wealth and, and money, with wealth and power, simply kept leaving the poor behind. And so we failed to and we failed to develop our human resource. And uh, many who were doing charity, who were doing development work, focused on women, which is good. They focus on the victims. I realized that the biggest challenge, how do you deal with the men? Because microfinance is about women. Microenterprise is about women. A lot of, uh, of uh, development effort is uh, on education, health is about women. But our criminals are men. Our rebels in the countryside are men. The cause of conflict are men. The cause of domestic violence are men. If men are the problem, why can't they be part of the solution? But who wants to deal with criminals and drug addicts? So anyway, since I came from them, I had greater confidence that perhaps I knew where they came from. So I went to the biggest slum at Metro Manila. And uh, every morning, I would leave before 6 o'clock, uh, to be able to work with them before noontime, because by noontime, the, the drug addicts, the drunks would be already a threat. And I did that for the first three months, and I set up a center. And it's nice also to have a, a wife who will support you even if she doesn't understand you. And this is what love does. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so, anyway, it, it would have been difficult if I didn't get her support. And it would have been difficult for me if she did not also support me with her money. Now, it's important because we have our also, when, when people go through their midlife crisis, they throw caution to, to the wind. And, uh, and uh, sometimes you have your own responsibilities too. But again, uh, realizing that, that uh, when we are on to a new path, 
that we are not there out of recklessness, but we are there also to discover new ways of making the world better. And I told my wife, my family, that we, this problem of extreme poverty uh, is not being taken seriously by government, which was corrupt by, by NGOs, which uh, were mostly dependent on a funding mentality. And also a lot of uh, people who want to do good but are afraid to go to the root of the problem in the slums, in the countryside. So anyway, uh, I told my family that I have to do this for the sake of my children because I don't want my children to inherit uh, a, th a third world country with a lot of slums that, that produce criminals that would be a threat to them. And so the old, I didn't want to see them uh, look for a path out of, of, of the country, which uh, was also the way that many of my people decided to take because of the corruption in government, because of the poverty, the lack of opportunity. And so I realized that some people had to stay and face the problem squarely and try to come up with just answers you know, I was not there because I had, a, I had the answer, I had a master plan. I just wanted to understand why we were poor. And so anyway, it, uh, it uh, took me seven years to really discover that by working with about 2,000 gang leaders, drug addicts in the biggest slum, which was also the biggest university for criminals in Manila. And uh, we buried a total of 16 of the uh, gang leaders uh, as a result of street fights, and a number of them gave up their weapons to go to, to school or start a job. And uh, they were still part of a, a survival environment uh, where the culture was uh, really an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So the, the work was so massive, and our response could not be small. So I realized that the experiences, the education I got in college, uh, in economics, and the experience I had with the multinationals that I worked with, and also the many friends I had who were entrepreneurs, they all contributed towards also trying to understand the problem and coming up with solutions. And so if the problem of poverty was massive, our, my response could not be small. And it had, to be, it had to be a movement, not just a project. But we had to start with proof of concept. So I started to build the first community in, that's in the slum, built by the men. So I went into building homes and schools, water systems, and building communities and for, for the men to have a pride of place because they could not receive a home if they did not uh, work for it. We required a sweat equity from the men and they had to undergo 27 sessions of values formation and they had to sign a covenant there would be no drunkenness, no drugs, no, uh, no, uh, and for the, and, and also no domestic violence. You know, these were, you're talking to people uh, to whom this was their daily life. But again, it was uh, something impossible, a lot of people thought was impossible. But then you also realize the greatness of the human spirit. And I came to realize a lot of good and a lot of uh, innate genius among the poor themselves because they're not the different from from us and and so when you talk about uh, uh, providing a decent environment for their families and also uh, motivating the children to study motivating the men to work and uh, when you come up with the immediate impact of the first community we built was peace because it was the man who caused the men who caused the the violence in the home and in the environment and later on we realized that we could also replicate this in other areas because at that time we had a lot of volunteers in the religious organization I belonged to. And so we tried to replicate this in 10 cities in, in uh, the most dangerous slums because if you can do it in a dangerous slum, then it is the rest of the country is easier. You know? And uh, we were not there because we had all the system, we had all the science, we had all the, 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 the training, and we had all the funding. We were there because because we were looking for solutions. And in the field of innovation, in all its incompleteness, inadequacies, <laughs> imperfection, the most important thing is the courage to dare. You know, to, to and so the f when, 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 yes, when, when uh, we were able to build the first community, it was replicated in 2,300 communities, and it has to date impacted on the lives of over a million people. And after the Typhoon Haiyan, 
uh, we are building now 30,000 homes and uh, supported by about uh, over, well, we just targeted a million volunteers, but uh, after two months of really massive campaign, we were able to get 1.6 million of volunteers. And uh, today I was happy to meet Vincent Faber because Tra Trafigura gave $100,000 and we didn't even, I didn't even personally know that, that I would meet the executive director of that organization. The thing here is when you have a vision uh, out of love for your country, it's not about the money. I didn't have a, a funding mentality. I just uh, want, it, I, you know, just build and they will come. I got this from that popular uh, movie, Field of Dreams. I guess it was Kevin Costner. But the thing here is that uh, this is what we're doing, and now we're building the economic platform for the sustainability of these communities. And I have the help of a lot of European students. We're working with 31 universities in Europe, particularly France, and we have uh, support from Air France, KLM, from Schneider Electric, from and even Medef. I was invited to speak in Medef last year, and now ESSEC is putting up their own village. EM Lyon is also putting up their own community. And so we realized that uh, we are really creating a global platform. And what we're doing in the Philippines now on a massive scale, we're starting to do in Indonesia. And the people working with us in Indonesia are now also the the rich and the poor working together, those in the urban areas and in the rural areas working together. So we have a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. And so we also have a hybrid of philanthropy, corporate philanthropy, and also for-profit sustainability, and so on. And we work with over 500 major corporations because uh, we realize that if they help us bring the poor out of poverty, we will actually help them build their market. So we are building the first farm village university in Asia at the Enchanted Farm and with the help of Shell uh, because uh, they built the road systems. Hyundai put up 50 million to put up the Green Innovation Center and, and many other corporations are helping us. Now Air France uh, is uh, helping us put up our school together with Credit Suisse and also Nestle. And so we realize that uh, even uh, corporations are moving from the traditional corporate social responsibility CSR to what we call corporate social investment. So we're now investing in uh, really global sustainability. And uh, I think as a final note, uh, I'm happy to be here uh, from Asia because this seems to be mostly a European crowd. But uh, the thing here is the young people of Europe are very curious about Asia, particularly about the Philippines. And we are building a platform which was built mostly by French volunteers. The they first started coming from ESCP, from HEC, from ESSEC, from EM Lyon, and now from 21 universities of, of, uh, of, of France. And the thing here is that we want them to see now Asia as not the mysterious uh, uh, east, but it's a place that they can also call home. The thing, because five of my grandchildren are, are also Europeans. My son-in-law is from England, and he's been married to my daughter for nine years, and now they have five kids now. So I didn't realize that, uh, that Europeans can also be prolific, you know. <laughs> but the thing is that we are building a global solidarity platform where Europeans are family to us Asians, and, and, and Filipinos also will find Europe as our home. So I guess we can achieve global harmony through hybridization. I don't know, that's, uh, but the thing here is that we have to see ourselves as a global family. Thank you.